Welcome back to yet another session of Blab2 NHS. In this session, we will be discussing on a broad classification of ear OSCE scenarios, where we'll be discussing how to approach a ear station with any presenting complaint, and then we will go on to dissect specific stations of ears, especially vestibular neuritis, acoustic neuroma, migraine, tinnitus, and so on. Let's begin. Um, the first station we'll discuss is, is about uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So this basically, in this particular station, the presently complaint of the patient will be, doctor, I am feeling dizzy. Now, when we speak about feeling dizzy, one important thing is to understand that dizziness can mean a lot of different things. We'll see what all things they can mean. Um, but when, when we, when, whenever a presently complaint of a patient is, doctor, I feel dizzy, it's very important to elicit and expand and elaborate what basically they mean by they feel dizzy. So your opening question to that would should be, what do you mean when you say, I feel dizzy? Now, as I said, being dizzy could be presyncopal, lightheadedness, vertigo, and disequilibrium. Now, we are not very much concerned about presyncopal here or either a disequilibrium. Presyncopal falls and stuffs, we have seen it in different stations. Lightheadedness and vertigo is something which we are more, most concerned about. When it is about BPVV, we are most concerned about vertigo rather than even lightheadedness. Now, the common differential diagnosis of BPVV can include minius, vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, acoustic neuroma, and migraine. Now, all of these are one or the other stations. Minius can be a station. Vestibular neuritis it's, itself is a station. Acoustic neuroma is a station. Migraine is a station. Now, labyrinthitis has never come. Minius have never come, but there is a potential ch chances that they can come because these stations are very closely related to each other. Okay, now, when we are with the define the dizziness, now, as I said, the world is spinning is the vertigo, which is very important for us, for this station. I feel being faint, which is presyncopal when we should have go about the patients with falls, um, hypoglycemic episodes and so on. And then some people may say that I feel like I might fall. They might have had a fall, they might not have had, had a fall. So in that situation, we will be thinking about disequilibrium, but that is not a scenario in cases of BPVV. So going back into the retrospective, whenever they say the doctor, I feel dizzy, we need to elicit and expand what do we what do they mean by they are feeling dizzy? Is it the world that is spinning or the room that is spinning or spinning of the room when they tilt their head? What were they doing? All such questions becomes of prime importance whenever we think about um, dizziness or room being spinning. Now, how we will go about in this scenario in this station, we will go about asking them, expanding the odd para that we generally know. Has it happened before? What is the additional question? I'm not going into odd para because you guys already know how to expand odd para, the presenting complaint. But what is the additional questions that we definitely have to ask? Has this happened before? If yes, how many times has it happened? How long did the each episode last? And was the each episode different from each other? And what were you doing at that time? for each episode. If they say multiple episodes, then we need to know what were they doing when this episode actually started. It's always important, not only for this condition, but for any condition when it is a periodic episode, we always have to ask these four questions. So not only for BPVV, but for any other scenarios as well. So how many times has it occurred? In cases of atrial fibrillation for palpitations also, we need to ask how many times has it happened before um, and how long does the each episode last? Was it different? And were you doing anything? What were you doing at that time when the episode is generally started? Okay, now is establishing the time is the second point which we need to do after we have expanded our presenting complaint. So as I said, each expanding of the timing, the timing of the vertigo is very important because that can lead for us to towards a diagnosis so as i said lasting less than a second is disequilibrium you know for a very brief moment you might feel that i'm going to fall but you don't fall maybe so disequilibrium okay lasting seconds to minutes which is in cases of bpvb so mostly it is less than a minute but it can sometimes be two minutes or even three minutes but most likely less than a minute 
lasting 20 minutes to several hours. This is very important because this is what we will be um, differentiating in further um, cases where the menias or migraine can cause such kinds of uh, vertigo episodes, which can last from 20 minutes till some several hours. And lasting days, it can be stroke, it can be sclerosis, or it can be labyrinthitis. But stroke is coming, but uh, like, you know, stroke is one of the very important OSCE stations that comes very often just like TIA, but we never ask these questions of vertigo because that's not a very common presenting complaint. But if it is lasting for days, that's one of the things that we should be having in our at the back of our head for differential diagnosis when we are thinking about some vertigo, which is lasting for days. Now, frequency. OK, so as whatever we have asked over here in the in the additional questions on the presenting complaint, that frequency will also help us direct us towards a particular diagnosis. If it is a multiple episodes, we would be thinking in terms of either minias, migraines, and BPVV. If it is only one episode which happens, it could be TIA, stroke, sclerosis, acoustic neuroma, labyrinthitis, or vestibular neuritis. We are more concerned over here about multiple episodes happening lasting between seconds to minutes and as had as have happened in the past multiple number of times okay now exaggerating and trigger factors what are the exaggerating and trigger factors which we do have to ask to the patients in order to elicit that this is more likely to be bpvv so what was the patient doing just before the start of his feeling dizzy and is there anything that is bringing this episode like for example in bpvv he will be telling movement of the head or when i was lying in the bed and i was turning around okay so if they don't say this, you we have to ask straightforward questions that is it specifically related to your head movement or anything else that also brings on your dizziness in your case. So they need to be, you, we need as a doctor, we need to have a clarification whether it is only the head movement or has it happened outside um, this particular head movement episode. Then we need to ask about patient occupation. Why? Because this will help us differentiate few diseases minias, migraine, and some psychiatric causes which can cause vertigo. So asking about the patient occupation and stress at work is very important. Now, dizziness related to posture. As I said, now, if it is related to posture, we will be looking for orthostatic hypotension. So that is your differential diagnosis. One question, rule out orthostatic hypotension. Now, earfulness after an infection or have you had any recent infection do you feel um have you had any viral illness recently or have you had any fever recently in that scenarios we can rule out vestibular neuritis and if it is caused by after a trauma it could again be a fistula which would have caused this triggering of the dizziness or sometimes even trauma can lead to bpvv so these questions trigger factors those are one liner questions very simple hardly will take 20 25 seconds and we will be looking at most of the trigger factors and we'll be ruling out the differential diagnosis as well now associated symptoms okay so like these are the same thing but in a different way just in order to make sure that we have understood whatever it is now different diseases i have already mentioned different diseases and what all questions can we ask whenever we are thinking about those diseases so in cases of bpbv we already discussed that it could be head position or any recent head trauma very important question minias disease oral fullness hearing loss or tinnitus okay so if any of these are your differential diagnosis or it is one of your main diagnosis and you want to rule out you can straightforward ask this question and it will help you to rule out very simple cases of these diseases migraines we know migraine about the headaches scotoma photophobia phonophobia and other stuffs vestibular neuritis tinnitus um, maybe associated with an ear infection which is most likely a cause labyrinthitis similar as vestibular neuritis but with hearing loss Acoustic neuroma, we will see today, headache, facial sensation loss, hearing loss, and sometimes can cause facial palsy. So these are the questions that you are generally supposed to ask if you want to rule out. But nevertheless, one question is more than enough to rule out a lot of different diagnoses. And we know that in the examination, given the time barrier of eight minutes, we cannot rule out all the differential diagnoses, but the main ones and very closely um, similar differential diagnoses should be ruled out first. Okay, and then we'll be going into past medical history, surgical history, nothing significant, similar way we, that we ask in all different scenarios, but specifically ask about constitutional symptoms because cancer can cause a vertigo, 
okay uh, medical history asks specifically about aminoglycoside furosemides and antidepressant because all these three can cause vertigo family history ask family history of bpvb or migraine or menias and social history remember to ask about smoking alcohol and stress if it is like we have already discussed if it is stress can also cause vertigo smoking can cause vertigo alcohol can cause vertigo okay so before moving into the explanation of the exact cause as i always say eyes in all medical history try to elicit ideas concerns and expectations which is very very important and once you know it because it's one of the very prime important factor like a check box in the um, examiner's uh, in the examiner's paper which you have to tick uh, to good to score good marks in the examination now we know what is bpvb the simple or the basic explanation for the patient should be to break down each word okay so the patient can ask these common questions first question that they can ask you what causes bpvb so it's basically caused when the chalk crystals in the inner ear becomes unglued from the normal place be as simple as possible if you want to say there are some crystals in the inner ear which becomes unglued from the normal place causing the entire episode now what caused my bpvb that could be a very important and a potential question from the patient so most cases of bpvb we know that it happens for no reason but as we elicit that sometimes trauma one of the major important effects can cause bpvb not been able to sleep for a pretty long periods of time or lying in the beds for pretty long periods of time can cause bpvb when you sudden change of posture that can be normal scenario or it could be related to something serious patients might ask doctor how long will it take before i can feel myself or how long before i feel any better right such questions is very difficult to answer because bpvb sometimes it can come back again so how long it's very difficult to say there are some uh, successful treatments that we can offer you but you still can feel unsteady at times the symptoms take time to go away so that's the best way to answer never give a specific diagnose uh, never give a specific timeline because we ourselves don't know and that is what we should be telling very clearly truthfully to the patient is there anything i should or should not do to help my bpvb the patient might ask this question or the patient might not ask this question but it is our duty and holistic approach for every station to tell the patient do's and don'ts related to the diagnosis so in this scenario you have to tell that yes your balance will be very poor and you need to take precautions that you don't fall specifically if you are going outside make sure that you have somebody around you okay so you will feel more sensitive to movement until the bpvb has completely healed so make sure to tell him that there is a chance that if you might feel vertigo you might fall prevent having a fall okay now can bpvb come back or can i prevent it okay unfortunately yes it can return and there is no way that we can know that we can stop it from coming because we can treat it with a very high success rate but there is always a chance that it can come back so these are some potential questions which the patients might ask or even if the patient don't ask remember to tell at least the fourth point which is a do's and don't in all the scenarios okay in cases of investigation we'll check the vitals neurology examination ear examination and special examination like holpit maneuver which is very very important in this scenario to at least speak directly in the examination otherwise you might not get any response from the examiner or the simulator and of course some blood investigation that is a routine blood investigation treatment if the patient is having nausea vomiting and tmetics particle positioning which is very important like the epis maneuver remember it is always performed by the seniors until unless you are experienced or you have performed it before we never say that we are going to do it ourselves remember always tell that the seniors will be coming and they'll be performing some special maneuver which is called epli which might help to fix back those crystals which have dislodged or unglued from their position back into their original position and this something which nothing works then there is something called as brandorf exercise which is performed by the patients themselves to help treat the vertigo in the episodes surgery is very rarely rarely done and we never give an option of surgery 
though i have written surgery over here because those are the treatments that we can offer but surgery is never a scenario that is performed it's like in a very rare case scenario where we know that the patients cannot completely ever be treated by bpvb and the patient is very old frail and there is a chance that he might fall and hurt himself or probably hurt himself very severely in those cases only we provide an option of surgery so in this station i would say avoid going till the surgery option okay but you can definitely use this exercise which is a very common exercise which is performed by the patients so this is something which was called as which the patients generally performed uh, with themselves okay so this is so this is a special exercise okay which is called as brant daroff exercise and it is performed by the patients they need to sit till their heads 30 seconds 45 degrees to the left and to the right as far as they are comfortable then lie down on that side for 30 seconds and then come back and do it on the other side so this is what is the basically uh, the exercise that they can do but remember this is uh, patients can do if they having refractory episodes of bpvp when we are talking about tinnitus now two kinds of tinnitus could be there one where the where the person himself is able to hear the tinnitus the ringing sound or the hissing buzzing sound whistling or humming they can describe it in many different ways so when the sound is present or coming from within the person that is what we call as subjective tinnitus okay so such kind of tinnitus is only perceived by sound from the affected individual now there is something called as objective tinnitus this tinnitus mostly is of vascular origin okay so there is some vascular um, origin which is somewhere near the uh, ear and that is causing a tinnitus or a ringing sensation which can be also be heard by the examiner any any doctor who is examining that affected ear that's called an objective tinnitus now this is very rare as it is written it's only in 1% of the people whereas subjective tinnitus is the most common one and which we will also be seeing now very important before we even enter into the discussing about tinnitus it is very important to understand when we do a referral now some patients might present into gp and some patients might present into the hospitals and accordingly we will have to think and understand which one can be helpful and what referral we need to do when do we do an immediate referral like to be seen between you know within few hours for example if the patient has been in the gp at this moment of time and we think that the patient is a high risk of suicide or there is some neurological function which is going on with related to some facial stuffs there is uncontrolled vestibular symptoms like ongoing vertigo ongoing vertigo i'm not saying previous episode ongoing vertigo or if there is a suspected stroke in such cases you we need to think about immediate referral okay immediate referral immediate referral should also be arranged for people who are having pulsatile tinnitus we will discuss about uh, pulsatile and it's a very important question that we need to ask in history taking when we are thinking about tinnitus pulsatile or not pulsatile intermittent or continuous okay and if it is if the tinnitus is secondary to head trauma the in all these six scenarios we have to make sure that we are doing an immediate referrals now these are immediate referrals which can be within few hours because it might take time now very urgent referrals that has to be seen within 24 hours should be arranged for people who are associated with hearing loss so hearing loss with tinnitus and which has just occurred between 3 days or less should have been doing a very urgent referral that means the doctor should be seeing the patient within 24 hours of time so these are a basic questions i have not arranged them we will see in further few slides where i have arranged the questions as we should be asking but these are the most important question that we cannot miss the age of the patient why because the age will tell us whether the patient is old if the patient is old it could be presbycusis yes onset and what what time is the onset if it is less than 3 as i said if it is between 3 days then we can refer urgently second under what circumstances did the tinnitus start same case as with cases of what i go under what circumstances what were you doing before you had the room spinning episode yes unilateral bilateral remember this is very important because this is something which we generally tend to forget either it is unilateral or bilateral because if it is unilateral we will have a different sets of ddx if it is bilateral we will have a different set of ddx it is constant or episodic okay is it pulsatile and does the sound fluctuate in intensity because if it is episodic 
then that means the intensity comes into the picture okay what makes the tinnitus worse and what makes it better do you find exposure to loud sounds making your tinnitus worse a very important question what are the risk factors that we need to ask is it associated with hearing loss what is your occupation and is your occupation related to any loud sound or loud noise exposure have you taken or are you taking any important drugs aspirin and sates and aminoglycoside which are a risk factors of having um tinnitus in the history of multiple sclerosis head trauma hyper or hypothyroidism remember we generally tend to forget hypo or hyper because we don't ask because it's not very common symptoms that we generally read when we are reading about hypo but let me tell you just via statistics hypothyroidism approximately 40 to 45% of patients having hypothyroidism can involve sensory neural hearing loss in both the ears not in one but both the ears okay and in cases and in cases of um, graves disease or hyper hyper parat uh, sorry hyperthyroidism the tinnitus is usually associated with heart rate so increase of heart rate with related to hyperthyroidism can cause tinnitus so i'm just saying because these are very important uh, thing which we don't really tend to ask uh, the patient um, but if you ask maybe that will be a differentiating point between you and the other candidates okay associated symptoms hearing loss vertigo oral fullness ear pressure ear pain or discharge dizziness or balance problem and visual changes we know all such things can help us to differentiate or find a differential diagnosis and to reach to a conclusion those are the associated symptoms now very important that when we are talking about tinnitus it is two things one we have already discussed that is head trauma second thing which is very important have you had ever undergone an operation which is involving your ear or head because sometimes a complications of operations in the ear or in the head can result in tinnitus and have you have you consulted anyone about this or have you taken any medications about this now in the next few slides i have tried to put in some pro forma that is being followed in the hospitals which will give you an insight exactly how you need to ask a question and what question should be following your previous question so in a basically in a perfectly orderly fashion all right so let's look at them let's start by asking the first question how does the tinnitus sound okay so they will tell you if it is sounding like a hissing hissing sound mumming sound or is it like a buzzing sound it is like they can describe it in many different ways yeah what is the usual site of tinnitus left right or left worse than right first it is unilateral bilateral if it is unilateral which side is it if it is a bilateral is it equal on both the side which one is worse or which one is not worse okay whether is the tinnitus constant or whether it is intermittent okay and does the tinnitus uh, tinnitus fluctuate in intensity or loudness what makes your tinnitus worse and what makes your tinnitus better you can take a screenshot of this screen because this is from my uh, hospital's pro forma so i'm sure these are the very important and valid questions that we should ask now tinnitus history when did you first become aware of your tinnitus right and when did your tinnitus first becomes disturbing so for example if the patient who has had tinnitus for like 4 5 months what happened that he never came to the hospital for the last 2 3 months or 4 months and what what happened now that he is coming to the hospital it's very important to understand that what has changed between those 3 4 months and now so when did your tinnitus first becomes become disturbing that you are coming to the hospital now under what circumstances did the tinnitus start for example uh, what were you doing when it started did you leave uh, is was it related to your job were you doing any job when it started and then you left your job and any anything it could be any related or any circumstances when the tinnitus basically started now what do you consider to have started the tinnitus ask the patient themselves do you have any idea so this is basically an idea do you think there's do you consider anything that you think and could have started your tinnitus and who have you consulted about your tinnitus have you actually consulted anyone gone to the gp not gone to the gp or this is the first time you are coming for help what have your previous professional said about your tinnitus if they have gone then that's the next question that we should be asking okay now these are the risk factors that we have to ask so been exposure uh, been exposed to gunfire or explosion 
how often were you exposed and did you did you wear any protecting um, hearing protection that's only if they say yes to the gunfire or explosion okay like some people um, can be work uh, can be working in a mining environment okay where there will be uh, loud exposure so are they wearing any hearing protection attended any loud events concerts clubs so after that so that is the time when the tinnitus started so when we ask that question we will understand that had any noisy jobs recently or were you working in a job which was very noisy had any head injuries or concussions any operations which is involving your ear or head any thinners alcohol based cleaners that you have used in your ears okay and taken any of the following medications now there are of course n number of medications that might cause tinnitus but i would tell you to just ask these three questions which is important i don't think so that you should ask any anything else aspirin and sides and aminoglycoside if you can remember the if you can remember other very well and good you can ask them you can ask those questions specific like quinine streptomycin and neomycin because those are all ototoxic so if you can ask them it's fine otherwise the most important things is about the aspirin aminoglycosides and nsaids now few simple stuffs you might ask might not ask not necessary to ask okay not 100% necessary to ask so i'm giving you all the potential questions that you might ask in cases of tinnitus now general hearing problems and the effect of tinnitus so you see of course in the hospital we don't have any time limit and we can ask a lot of questions so these is the pro forma which i have taken which has n number of questions yeah the patient has to say yes or no for a lot of questions but in the examination we don't have such times and we need to prioritize and understand which one is the most important one okay this is something similar to the questions that we have already asked but effect of tinnitus is very important so does your tinnitus prevent you from getting sleep at night or does it wake you up in the in the night many number of times okay and how has it affected your work and your home life or your social activities so this is basically a holistic approach understanding from the patient's perspective how badly that tinnitus has actually affected their life or their general day to day routine in general health now how is the general health been like and how you taking any medication now in medications we have already discussed about them okay now five questions that they might ask or you need to ask which is very very important what do you believe got the tinnitus okay and did it suddenly begin or did it develop gradually now each questions has its own interpretation and your own way of going about a differential diagnosis so if the if if the tinnitus is begin suddenly then it could be a loud or a single event could be a loud noise or could be a traumatic injury okay but if it is, if it is beginning um if it has began very gradually that means it is progressive or if it is associated with a hearing loss then we might be thinking about presbycusis in old age patients or a prolonged long exposure in case of um patients with an occupation history okay so age of the patient as we said in cases of tinnitus very important because we'll be able to directly elicit that it could be and we will be ruling out presbycusis on the very first time now if the hearing loss is present or is the tinnitus heard in one ear both ears or does it fill the head so unilateral tinnitus with a uh, hearing loss which is conductive hearing loss can present in otitis media impacted cerumen or any other middle ear pathology but if it is associated with unilateral but sensory neural hearing loss it's a red flag which is like a vestibular schwannoma and requires further diagnostic testing so this unilateral tinnitus why do we why did i or like why did we think that the unilateral is very important usual site of tinnitus because that will help us to tell us about the ddx that we will be thinking when we complete the history taking unilateral with a sensory neural hearing loss or with a hearing loss in the initial part of the history should raise a red flag for vestibular schwannoma okay and is the tinnitus continuous or how does it sound like you know pulsatile tinnitus suggests of vascular origin as i have told and should be evaluated by a physician that means by a ent physician what medications are being used and what are the ongoing medical problems now ototoxicity as i said all kinds of nystatin gentamicin or right aminoglycosides should be asked if the patient is taking along with that if the patient is having some withdrawal of some drugs which can cause 
which can also cause tinnitus. So it's important to elicit any kind of drugs that the patient has been taking and to see whether those drugs have a potential to cause tinnitus. Now, does the tinnitus change with the neck movement or oral facial movements? Why it is important? Because sometimes somatosensory modulation of tinnitus is common. As I said, TMJ. So that's one of the most common scenarios that you generally see. So in such patients, when we have that is called as a somatosensory modulation, which is causing the tinnitus. So we don't have a grave pathology there. Now, what investigations and management do we nearly need to perform in this scenario? Okay, so audiology, which is very, very important, but and if it is unilateral, as I said, it's a red flag having a sensory neural hearing loss. We need to perform a brainstem response and an MRI with a, with a gadolinium enhanced MRI in order to see if there is a lesion, which we will discuss in some slides. Now, CT to diagnose globus tympanicum, I, as I said, it is very, very rare, right? an MRI or angiogram to diagnose any malformations. And if you suspect any metabolic abnormality, then you can go with any lipid profile tests or TSH test. As I said, TSH, both hypo and hyperthyroidism can cause tinnitus. So if you suspect any metabolic abnormality, go with those tests. Okay, now these are the general management when the tinnitus cannot be treated and these are the management when we know what is the cause of tinnitus. So if a cause is found, then we treat the cause. Let's suppose if it is an inner ear effusion which is causing the tinnitus, we can drain it or we can have the embolization done or if there is um, if there is a atrial venous malformation, we can have the excision and we can have the correction. If there is no treatable cause, remember 50% will still improve, 25% will worsen and 25% will remain the same. What are the holistic approach? Avoid loud noises, ototoxic medications, caffeine and smoking, which can cause, refer the patient to tinnitus clinics. So this is something which is important. Refer the patient to tinnitus clinics where they will be seen within six weeks of time. And if the tinnitus is bothersome, ask the patient to mask the tinnitus with soft music or white noise. So white noise is nothing but soft music. Hearing aid, if it is existing with a hearing loss and you do not really have a cause and you cannot treat the cause to treat the hearing loss, we can provide hearing aid to the patient. And if the tinnitus instruments, there are something called as tinnitus improvement, which people generally use in the hospitals in when along with the hearing aids. Or this is something which I would I'm just I've just mentioned here, but I would ask you to avoid it using it in the examination. Never say about the trial of tokenamide. Now, if the tinnitus is unknown and cannot be treated, now we have to refer them to the talking therapy. So there is something called as tinnitus counseling. Cognitive, we know about CBT, and there is something called as tinnitus retraining therapy. So three things to remember in management. First, holistic approach to avoid loud noise, autotoxic medication, caffeine, and smoking. And where we can refer the patient to is tinnitus clinic, CBTs, tinnitus counseling, and tinnitus retraining therapy. Third, hearing aids if the patient is having hearing loss and we do not really know the cause. And, um, and the next is that if the patient says that will it be treated? And if you don't, are you not sure about the cause of it, then we don't know. There are chances that you might improve, you might get worsened, or it might remain the same. Okay, so this is something which we know as a holistic approach in terms of management. Now, specifically, when we are discussing the acoustic neuroma, since the present complaint in the acoustic neuroma is also tinnitus, everything remains the same. The history taking, the proforma that we went through remains the same. Holistic approach remains the same. Specific presentation and specific diagnosis, what we need to do, that only we will discuss about in this. Presentation of acoustic neuroma, you, what are the uh, what are the check boxes? Unilateral tinnitus, sensory neural hearing loss, which only affects the ear. Dizziness, but remember the dizziness is not a true vertigo, but is a result of a tumor growth, which slowly and, compens and compensates. Facial nerve palsy with, triminal, with trigeminal sensory deficits are very late complications. Now, large acoustic neuroma can also cause headaches, double vision. That is why if you remember, we have asked the question in the history taking about vision problems because that might elicit once we have have gone into a diagnosis of okay this is acoustic neuroma and if there is a vision problem we might be thinking okay it might be very big now because it's a because it's one of the symptoms of a large acoustic neuroma which is not generally seen in cases of a normal presentation 
numbness, pain or weakness on one side of the face. So that is also what we have asked in the question. Problems with limb coordination that can cause and there is a difficulty in hoarseness. So if you remember, this is one of the very important questions that we have all asked. What are the differential diagnostics? Very important differential diagnostic is Meniere's disease. And the only way to differentiate between both of them is to do an MRI. And the MRI that we generally do is with the help of a gadolinium contrast, which is the gold standard method for diagnosing of acoustic neuroma. And how do we diagnose it? With a history, whatever the clinical presentation they are presenting with. When we do an examination and we find out the renestase and the webestase that it's the sensory neural hearing loss of one side, and then the radiology CT to rule out other, other, uh, any other, um, any other lesion that is present in the brain or MRI specifically for acoustic neuroma to look for acoustic neuroma. Now, treatment, the whole, apart from the holistic approach, specific for acoustic neuroma should be there is expected management if the tu tumor is very small or in the elderly. We'll have to do a regular MRI scans to keep an eye on its size and its growth. There is something which is also called a stereotactic radio surgery. So that only takes place when we have a very large tumor and we need to break down into smaller ones and that is the time when we use it. Now there are again a lot of different questions which the patient might ask and we might be cornered because those questions sometimes becomes very important. Now the questions that can be asked by the patient is does the surgery carry any risk? So once you tell them the option of surgery about the radio surgery they might ask you these questions that does the surgery carry any risk? Now, all these options carry some risk, all the options of going into surgery. So any surgery carries some risks. So surgery and radio surgery that we can do sometimes can result in facial numbness or the inability to move a part of your face. So partial facial paralysis. Okay, will it grow or cause more problems? So it rarely grows to a stage where it is life threatening. Many grow very slowly or they, some, some do not grow at all. And those which grow, we can treat them very quickly with either radiostatic radio, sorry, stereostatic radio surgery, or we can, or we can treat them or we can keep an eye on them with the help of an regular MRI scans. Now, will it return if I opt for surgery? Let's suppose patient wants to know that doctor, if I undergo a surgery, is there a chance because it's a tumor? Of course, it's a benign one, but will it return back? So an acoustic neuroma can occasionally return after the treatment, but it happens one in every 20 people who have had a surgical removal of such tumors. Okay, and will my symptoms improve post the treatment? Now, the most important concerns of the patient is basically the tinnitus and the hearing loss. So will it return? So here's some part of hearing loss and tinnitus can still persist. They might not retrieve or they might not completely resolve 100%, but some percentage might remain back and they can still persist and they might affect your ability to work, communicate or drive. And if it is, if you are having any hearing loss, if you're having any tinnitus, then it becomes very important that you reveal back that to the DVLA. So again, the DVLA will come into the picture. So uh, this is the next topic that we'll be seeing, which is otitis externa or the swimmer, uh, swimmer's ear. So it is caused by pseudomonas aeruginosa, just a brief outline about what it is, and Staphylococcus aureus. It's That's why it is one of very important that if initially it is not treated, then we take a swab to see what organism is actually brewing in the ear so that we can treat them accordingly. Now, what are the cardinal symptoms of a swimmer's ears? The pain and the tenderness is the most important. So the patient will be coming with an otalgia or ear pain, okay? And apart from that, what can be there? There can be pain with the jaw, jaw movement, fullness in the ear, itching in the ear canal and discharge from the ear. Now, fever is very, very rare, but it can occur as well. One important thing, ask the patient very clearly, did the itching start before your pain started? Yeah, because why it is because some most of the times the itching actually precedes the pain and the discharge from the canal. So this is one of the very important um, aspect of otitis external. Now type of discharge, remember it's very important. It can be purulent, it can be non-purulent and it has to be elicited from its history. Now, what is the chief complaint of the patient? How are we going to go about in the station? Chief complaint of the patient, otalgia, ear pain. That means we know that we have to uh, elaborate the Socrates in itself. What are the associated symptoms of that can cause ear, the similar symptoms of ear pain? The risk factors of otitis externa, past medical history, the social history, and so on. So the usual aspect, it's not a very difficult station, just few important um, simple questions that we don't need to forget. 
So the chief complaints, what brought you in here today and when did you first notice the problem? Now, I'm not going into details of Socrates. We know how the Socrates is. Remember, it's very important again, unilateral or bilateral, okay? Unilateral or bilateral, which is very important. Okay, now the associate symptoms. Now there are varieties of associated symptoms that we can ask. So first associate symptoms we have to ask is about the ear itself. Nose and sinuses are something that people tend to ask and mouth and throat as well. But we can't ask all the questions given the time limit. So remember, since it is related to the ear, we will ask all the questions related to ear. Nose and sinuses will ask few questions and few questions from mouth and throat so that we are ruling out few DDX, the examiner knows and we are being a safe doctor. So symptoms which is arising from the ear itself. So do you have a discharge and what types of discharge and so on? When did it start? What is the color? Is it purulent, foul smelling? Is it related with blood? So on. Itching, ringing sensation of tinnitus, hearing loss, vertigo and nystagmus. All questions need to be asked, very important. Nose and sinuses. As we have already asked itching, we don't need to ask itching, runny or congested nose not to be asked. The most important question to ask is headache and heaviness. When, when related to the mouth and throat, pain on swallowing, very important, difficulty in swallowing, very important, and spasms of jaw muscles or does this problem occurs or ear pain occurs with your jaw movement because again we want to rule out TMJ because as I said the cardinal symptoms might include pain with jaw movement so how will we know it is otitis externa or it is TMJ okay so it's very important to ask this question now constitutional symptoms since we know this pain ear pain can cause because of a tumor or any kinds of cancer which so we need to ask this constitutional symptoms of fever, nausea, vomiting, change in weight um, or appetite. Risk factors. So risk factors is very important. Any recent ear infections that have had that will tell us that there could be a perforated tympanic membrane or a middle ear effusion if there is an infection, a history of recent ear infection, recent upper respiratory tract infection, rhinitis, sinitis, because we know that both all the E and T are connected with each other. So infection in any part of them can cause infection in other parts. So any recent upper respiratory tract infection, rhinitis, sinitis, okay. Attempts at cleaning the ears with cotton soap or sharp objects that can cause very important damage to the ear and can cause ear pain. Recent trauma to head, neck or ears barotrauma now we know barotrauma in itself is a uh, osteo station so it it goes in the similar way of an ear pain station but we just need to ask very important question on barotrauma specifically what did you do recently did you travel recently did you do any diving or did you have any trauma they, because those are the potential causes which can cause um which can cause this pain and which can cause hemotympanum if there is no causes of otitis externa like no swimming history now dental status as i said any dental status dental hygiene presence of dental abscesses all can be related to somatosensory and through the nerves can cause your ear pain because all of them are related problems in the neck movement in the neck and temporomandibular joint disorders as we have discussed Recent travel or contact with sick people. So barotrauma is again, and if there is a contact with sick people, which is might have been a cause of infection spread, can lead to um, otalgia and ear pain. Now, chronic illness, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, immunocompromised state. When we are ruling out any histories of diabetes or immunocompromised state, we are eliciting the uh, we are eliciting to the examiner that we are ruling out few differential diagnoses. Malignant otitis externa, furuncle, which is very, very common with diabetes and immunocompromised state. Yeah, and ear surgeries, if they have patient have had any ear surgery. So any issues with the ear, always remember the surgical history of ear can cause, in cases of vertigo, always remember any head or ear, both of them can cause uh, vertigo. But in cases of uh, otalgia, only ear surgeries are more than enough. Let's uh, move on. The past medical history, we know the chronic illnesses that we have asked. You can ask about there is a um, there is a something called as cervicofacial pain syndrome that is not very much necessary so you can forget about that and have you been diagnosed with any tumors in the head or the neck because both head or neck tumor can cause otalgia it's like a referred pain kind of a stuff past surgical history any previous hospital admissions surgical procedures in the ear very specifically 
and any blood transfusions, family histories with family members with similar complaints, chronic diseases or anyone in and around having any infection that you have come across or you have come in contact with. Social history of smoking, okay, because that can aggravate if there is an infection, alcohol consumption and occupation because if there is an ototoxic from the chemicals or the noise pollution, which can also cause ear pain. Now the treatment, we have to, we can manage with we, the first thing that we have to manage as a junior doctors is to make sure that we are managing the presenting complaint, which is the pain in itself. So we have to manage any aggravating or precipitating factors. Okay. And then we need to see in the ear during the examination if there is an ear wax or debris which is obstructing the uh, which is obstructing the view and obstructing the application of any medication. And we need to clean the external ear. Now, what recommendations do we generally give? We do not provide. Remember, oral antibiotics are not an indication in cases of uh, otalgia. So in cases of ear pain or in cases of swimmer's ear, oral antibiotics are not to be given. We can prescribe topical antibiotics with or without uh, corticosteroids preparation. In, if the patient is having pain, we can tell them to take paracetamol or ibuprofen. And if they, that doesn't work, we can additionally add codeine at the maximum patient might ask how much time does it take or how much how long do i have to take the medication minimum seven days to maximum 10 days seven to ten days is the usual time that we generally need to uh, take the medications and it might get better between these time periods now holistically what do, do we have to tell the patients avoid any damage to the external ear canal so if there is a problem of ear wax which is actually obstructing the ear make sure to seek any um, advice from the hospital to professional advice so that it can be removed without any further damage to the ear canal ask the patients not to clean any their ears with any sharp objects or cotton buds very regularly make sure to keep the ears clean and dry because and to abstain from any water sports from 7 to 10 days ask the patients to cover their ears when they are actually taking a bath which is very very important because again for seven to ten days you don't want them to wet the uh, to get their ears wet and to brew more infection and organisms now if again as i said before if it is not getting treated then we take a swab and we send it so that once we know which organism is brewing we can advise accordingly um, specific antibiotics topical antibiotics that might be working against that particular organism so no shampoo no soap and no water inside the ear during the bath during bathing or showering okay and remember to remember that otitis externa is not a uh, ex sorry the External otitis is not actually a contagious, so swimmer's ear is not a contagious disease, so you don't have to limit your contact with any of the patients. Okay, so of course, as I have told you before as well, that we don't have to uh, take the name of the medications, you just have to tell topical antibiotics, which is, could be more than enough. Okay, thank you guys for joining in. See you next time. <laughs>